Hi, everyone. Welcome to module two of psychology of behavior, where we're introducing you to applied behavior analysis and in a six part series to really get you comfortable with the idea of what it is. My name is Jen Naradka and I am a BCBA or a behavior analyst that works with the Ottawa Catholic School Board. Um, I'm gonna bring you through increasing skills using applied behavior analysis. So uh, this is the team. This is the OCSB behavior analyst team. You already heard from Marilyn Green for module one, and she brought you through really a good introduction of what applied behavior analysis is and how we look at behavior um, in general, what the underlying philosophies are. I'm gonna bring you through module two, I'm Jen, and Robin Bertrand is gonna bring you through modules um, three and four about decreasing behavior. Uh, so decreasing challenging behavior using ABA. Um, Becky Carter is going to bring you through some common applications of applied behavior analysis. And then Sarah Prince is going to wrap us up here, bringing you through all the other applications of applied behavior analysis, which are quite wide and varied, as you saw in, in the video that Marilyn showed you in module one and some of the things that she mentioned in module one. So these are the learning modules. There are six in total. And right now we're about to dive into module number two. So I'm really excited to be with you for the next half an hour or so. All right, so the biggest lesson to learn about how we teach using ABA is that we break skills down. So we really like this little um, meme and it shouldn't matter how slowly some children learn as long as we're encouraging them not to stop. And so what we really do when we look at skill acquisition or skill development or teaching new skills to anyone, regardless of their age, developmental level, um, location, what we look at is what is that skill and how do we break down all the mini skills or the prerequisite skills that might be involved in allowing that person to be successful to learn that bigger skill. So if you think about um, a skill like reading, well, the prerequisite skills to that would be um, identifying letter sounds, identifying the blends of letters and how that sounds. Um, all of those types of skills lead into um, a much better chance of you learning how to read successfully. So what we do in applied behavior analysis is we break all kinds of skills down in that way or a very similar way. And we teach all those pre-skills first when needed, and then we can build toward the eventual goal. Um, so how we look at teaching and learning and applied behavior analysis, one of the biggest fundamental sort of philosophical underpinnings of ABA is that we do believe all behavior is learned. What I mean by that is, um, from birth, we are taking the information from our environment um, and it informs why we continue to do certain behaviors and why we don't continue to do other behaviors. So I'm going to talk to you about that in this module um, so that you better understand how we view teaching and learning through an applied behavior analysis lens. So what we do first is we do what we call skills assessments. So if we're gonna teach you a skill, um, we first need to know where you're at. So in order to create a goal for learning of any kind of learning, we need to know um, what your baseline is or what where you're at right now. So what I mean by baseline, you might be tying that back to really an empirical science, right? We need to know what our baseline is to then know um, where you're at, and if we're really impacting change, are we actually teaching you like we're intending to? So behavior analysts use a variety of very specific assessment tools to determine which skills a person has mastered or that they already have in their repertoire that are really solid skills they already know, which skills are emerging, so they're, they're there a little bit, but they're maybe not super consistent, or they're not really solid, full, complete skills. Um, and which skills still need to be learned? So wh what are the skill deficits that really could be critical in this person's success? So I'll bring you through three really quickly. Um, the one on the left is called the ABLES. It, that stands for the Assessment of Basic Language and Learning. So ABLES runs um, up to about the age six, so from zero to six, and it, it 
it helps you assess a variety of different skills across many, many domains. I think there's 26 domains in the ABLE. So everything from self-help skills, reading, writing, cooperation skills, matching skills, receptive language skills, expressive language skills, imitation skills, all kinds of different skills. And it really gives us a good idea, not only just how, where the student is at with different skills, but how they're best possibly able to learn new skills. So if you have a really good imitation repertoire or ability to imitate, then modeling is gonna be maybe a better way to teach you than, than someone else who maybe doesn't have a really good, strong imitation repertoire. So we use these assessments to create goals, but also to understand what types of teaching strategies might be best for our, our learner or our student. Another one here we have is the AFLS, and you can see there's multiple different books in the AFLS. AFLS stands for the Assessment of Functional Living Skills. So that actually brings us from early elementary all the way through adulthood. Um, the AFLS covers all kinds of skills, such as vocational skills, independent living skills, everything from money management to how to do an interview for a job. So it breaks, it looks at those skills um, as broken down mini prerequisite skills, and it helps us measure where you're at with those skills and then where we can teach you next. The third one there is called VB Map for short. It's the Verbal Behavior Milestones Assessment and Placement Program. So what that one is, it's, a, it's about up to four year old level. And that again is very similar to the ABLES in that it has a variety of different domains that it tests you in. And so all three of these are just examples of the different types of skills assessment tools that behavior analysts use. All of them were created by behavior analysts and they're very common in the field of, of ABA. And really the goal is to use a criterion referenced um, tool to know where our students at. What I mean by that is these tools don't compare the learning goal you're at now to other people. It compares the learning goal you're at now to yourself. So we can repeat these assessments in six months or repeat these assessments in a year and see where your growth is in all these different domains. So hopefully that um, makes sense that we wanna use different skills assessment tools. Um, and the goal again is to create a baseline. Where are you at now so that we can we can jump off from there? Okay, so we need to figure out the priority skills that we want to assess for teaching. These are some of the priority skills that behavior analysts look at across populations. So everything from young children or toddlers to um, older people to um, teachers to all kinds of skills that we look at. Where are you at with these skills and where are we? Where can we go next? So the, the first skill is communication. Can you ask for what you need and you want? How many you, words can you use? How are you using those words? Um, are you able to communicate with other people when you have a comment about your environment? So all those questions are questions that we're seeking to answer through a skills assessment. Cooperation, can you follow instructions, take another person's lead? Um, are you, you know, um, within the context of a group, how is that going for you in a one-to-one -one situation? How cooperative are you with the people around you and the environment around you? Tolerating no and waiting. So can you wait for preferred things? Can you tolerate not having preferred things at all? Um, can you give up preferred things when it's time to move on? So these are skills that we know some adults really have a, a hard time with. And sometimes um, when you're having challenging behavior, these all of these priority skills tend to be in some combination the underlying factor, the skill deficits that we need to actively explicitly teach you in order for you to have an easier time um, getting rid of those challenging behaviors, but also learning in general. So social skills is another one. Can you keep your attention on someone else? Can you engage with someone else? Um, can you be in pro close proximity to other people? So what are those social, social skills um, looking like? Imitation skills, can you learn through modeling and watching others imitate? Uh, and academic skills, can you read, can you write, can you count? All of those types of skills too. So when we look at those different assessment tools that I showed you, we really are look, trying to measure um, 
where you're at with a variety of different skills. So those tools measure a lot more than just these priority skills, but these, these skills are some of the first that we start to look at when we have a learner and we're trying to figure out um, what are the skill deficits and, and what are the skills that we really want to start targeting. Um, okay, so next up, now that we know kind of where the person's at, we have a baseline of where the skill is at. Next up, we have to make a goal. What's our target, okay, based on that information, based on that data? So I know Marilyn mentioned a lot that we are a data-based field. So we, we make decisions based on what the data is telling us. So based on the assessment data, where do we go next? Well, we go um, right into developing a target for skill acquisition. So now that we've assessed existing skills, let's make a goal. Now the SMART goal formula, we're using it here because it's something that most people have heard of before, can relate to, you're, you're probably learning about it in a variety of different ways. It's not always something necessarily tied to applied behavior analysis. We don't use the SMART goal formula to describe everything, but what we found with this particular image and the idea behind making a SMART goal is that it aligns quite nicely with the way that we create really good specific goals in applied behavior analysis. So it has to be specific, it has, you have to clearly identify the goal, so much so that it's clear enough that anybody else reading that goal knows exactly what the target is and can, can pinpoint that target. It has to be measurable, so you have to be able to measure success with that goal. Is the student learning or is the person learning the skill that we've set out for them to learn? Is it attainable? Uh, choosing goals that are realistic and manageable, and that's really where ABA does a great job at breaking those down to attainable, shorter term uh, building block goals that help build toward that bigger goal. Um, relevant, so you have to make sure it's important to you. This is a critical one in behavior analysis. As Marilyn mentioned in module one, we are very interested in socially significant behavior. What does that mean? That means the person who's learning this skill, it has to impact their life in a big way. It has to make their life better. So that's a huge, huge part of how we, we bring that relevance to, to creating our goal. And time bound, of course, you want to be able to know uh, in what time frame is it realistic for us to attain this goal. And of course, time bound is an important component because when we have building blocks, we, we need to, to, to learn one and then learn the next. So we have to have a time frame that that, that that works out in. So overall, these are our SMART goals. So now that we've created a goal, so first we've assessed where we're at. Then we've created the goal of what we're gonna teach next. Then uh, we're gonna do an ASR. So if Marilyn didn't mention this, an ASR means active student responding. What it basically means is this is a check-in for yourself to see how am I doing so far? Am I, am, am I understanding everything Jen's saying? Um, or am I getting a little bit lost? And when we do present live, ASRs are a great, very valuable way for us to get live feedback from the audience about if they're following along or if we need to spend more time on a topic. But this can be used um, for you to check in with yourself. How am I doing? Do I understand what's, what's happening so far? So the first ASR is, when using applied behavior analysis to teach a new skill, it is critical to start with A, baseline and assessment, of where the skill is now, B, teach the best way you know how and adapt later if it fails, or C, show the person how to do the skill and hope they figure it out. Stop and think. All right, and the answer is A. So when using applied behavior analysis to teach new skills, it is critical to start with an assessment or baseline of where we are at right now. That's great. If we don't do that, you risk you, you run the risk of creating a goal that is not very attainable because it's, it's not actually measured to where your student is at and making big assumptions about prerequisite skills that may be there or may not be there. And so usually when you're having a really hard time meeting a goal, we need to, we need to take a closer look at what those baseline um, skills are at with those prerequisites. 
All right, so now we need a carrot. So another underlying philosophy that meant that Marilyn mentioned earlier in module one of applied behavior analysis is we need to look at how we learn what we learn, what our learning history tells us about the way that we learn and uh, the way that we need to teach. So this little clip is really cute. This will never work. None of us even like carrots. And isn't that true? When you're being taught something, if the end does not, does not meet the, the goal, then that's not effective teaching. That's, that's not going to be effective learning for the learner. So um, we need a carrot. We need to find out what is it that that person wants or needs and how will teaching them this skill get them to that end? So think about uh, what is your carrot to learn how to drive when you're a teenager, right? Your carrot is the freedom you get when you get in the car and you get to drive where you want to go and uh, when you want to go there and it gives you some of that freedom, right? So that's a really valuable reason why that's your carrot. That's why you're so motivated to learn the skill of driving, even though it can be frustrating. And even though there can be so many, many prerequisite skills you've got to learn before you get behind the wheel, um, that's the carrot that, that we get. And that's just a natural carrot. Nobody needs to say, learn how to drive and then I'll pay you $100 as a reward. Well, no, the natural carrot is built in to the end that you get when you have learned the skill. So sometimes for our learners, we need to identify what that carrot is and it's already existing in their environment, which is great. And other times we don't know what the carrot is um, or there isn't one that's obvious that's already embedded into their environment or intrinsic to the situation. And so we need to build one in. We need to identify their preferences. What do they like? What can we provide that will make learning this skill easier and faster for the learner? So that brings us to preference assessment. So another type of assessment tool we use in applied behavior analysis are called preference assessments. So why do we need to know what your preferences are? Well, number one, if we know what you like, we can use those things to teach you. So it's easier to learn a concept when all your preferences are embedded into the concept, right? The second reason is if we know what you like, uh, we can use it to reinforce you. So this is an interesting word, reinforce, okay? We use this a lot in applied behavior analysis. Uh, Marilyn mentioned in module two, we're gonna hear a lot more about it throughout the rest of the modules as well. But if, if what we have to teach you isn't in and of itself intrinsically rewarding or reinforcing for you, then what we do is we need to know what your preferences are so we can build in some reinforcement at the end to make it worth it for you to learn the skill. And again, we can, it's, it's just more difficult to teach someone a new skill if there's nothing in it for them. If there isn't a natural built-in environmental reinforcer or something that we're otherwise offering um, to really build in the learning. So these are just some examples of some preference assessments that are common in the field of ABA. I won't go into them in detail, but they are formal, um, you know, as preference assessment tools, free operant assessment, single stimulus assessment, paired, a multiple stimulus um, assessment with or without replacement. So those are just the titles of different formal preference assessment measures that we use to assess our learner. What do they like? And it's, because it's not always as simple as saying, what do you like and getting some answers. Sometimes we have to, to you know, formally, formally assess those things. Okay. So we're gonna dive into the ABCs of behavior. You're gonna hear a lot more about the ABCs of behavior with Robin in module three and four, but I'm gonna introduce them to you here. Um, so A stands for antecedent, B stands for behavior, and C stands for consequence. So the antecedent is happen what happens right before a behavior, seconds before a behavior happens. The B is for the behavior, what the behavior looks like, and the C is what happens right after. So don't think consequence is something negative. That's not how we mean it in applied behavior analysis. Consequence in applied behavior analytic terms just simply means what comes after the behavior. So I'm gonna bring you through a list of examples in the next slide that really bring out the, the um, you know, how ABCs are everywhere, the common, the common ways that we see ABCs everywhere in our environment. All right, so you'll see at the top antecedent, behavior, consequence. These are the ABCs of how we learn behavior. And in applied behavior analysis, 
behavior, um, we don't just we don't mean problem behavior. We just mean all behavior. And we be remember we believe that all behavior is learned. So here's how we see that behavior is learned. So the first ABC is you see a cracker and you're hungry. So when you're when you're a toddler or a baby and you say cracker and you get a cracker as a consequence to saying cracker, you're now learning through experience through your environment that when I'm hungry and I do that behavior. I get a consequence. I get some reinforcement. Okay, that makes that that behavior stronger. Think of reinforcement as building reinforcements in a structure. It makes that behavior stronger. And it makes me want to do it again next time I'm in that antecedent condition of man, I'm hungry. Okay, so the next one is a peer takes your toy. So what do you do? You hit the peer, and the peer gives the toy back. So in the antecedent, I'm learning that. I don't like what just happened. The behavior that I tried was a hit you and I got my toy back. Okay, so we're just looking at what the behavior is hitting. What happened right before? Well, someone took your toy. What happened right after? They gave the toy back. Okay, so every behavior in, in everything that we do happens within an ABC context. The third one, you're driving to work. That's the antecedent. The behavior, you're speeding. The consequence is you get a ticket. Okay, so what happens before and after impacts if that behavior increases or decreases in the future. Okay, the next one, we see the fire, we touch the fire, we get burned, right? So hopefully it doesn't happen to you too many times before you learn not to touch the fire. But that behavior is going to be shaped based on the experience you've had with engaging in it in the past. Um, and what you learned from that. So mom asks you to cut the grass. You cut the grass and she gives you $20. Okay, so how you've learned to cut the grass is that the A happened that mom asked you and that the C happened that she gave you 20 bucks. Okay, so in the future now you're learning, you're learning how these contingencies work. Uh, the next one is teacher asks a question in class. You answer the question correctly, and the teacher says you're right. That's a quick A, B, C of a common environmental thing that happens. The last one, you see your crush in class for anyone who loves 80s uh, teen movies as much as I do. You see the crush in your class. You go up and you say hi, and the crush smiles and asks you out. Okay, that wouldn't that be a dream A, B, C to have happen, right? So if that happens to you, um, are you more or less likely next time you see a crush in class to go up and say hi? Because you're starting to learn your experience in your past is starting to teach you that that's a behavior that's that's paying off for you. You want to do that behavior more. So hopefully you're seeing how 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 we view in behavior analysis all ABCs and all behavior. So what is reinforcement? My definition for reinforcement is anything that happens after a behavior, so in the consequence column, that increases that behavior in the future. If you do that behavior again and again and again, it means you've met reinforcement. It means that behavior has been reinforced. Okay, so which consequence was reinforcing? We're gonna give a thumbs up. Yes, it was reinforcing, meaning that behavior is gonna happen again because of the consequence, or no, it wasn't reinforcing meaning that behavior might not happen again because of the consequence. So you see a cracker when you're hungry, you say cracker, you get a cracker. Yeah, that consequence was reinforcing. You're likely to do that behavior again next time because you've got reinforcement. The peer takes the toy, you hit the peer, and the, the peer gives the toy back. Yeah, you're likely to do that behavior again because the consequence was reinforcing to you. It got you what you needed, got you what you wanted. You're driving to work, you're speeding, you get a ticket. No, that consequence was not reinforcing. So that means you're less likely to speed, at least in the immediate future, right? Uh, you see fire, you touch the fire, you get burned. Or what do you think? Good, you're right. So the consequence was not reinforcing. You're not likely to touch fire again next time you see it, right? Mom asks you to cut the grass, you cut the grass, mom gives you 20 bucks. Yes, that consequence was reinforcing. Good job. Teacher asks the question. The student answers the question correctly. The teacher says, you're right. Yes, good job. Thanks for responding, right? Uh, yeah, that, that consequence is pretty reinforcing. You're going to do that again because the consequence signaled to you that you did a good thing. 
Uh, you see the crush in class, you go up and you say hi, and the crush smiles and asks you out. Yeah, that's a reinforcing consequence for sure, because otherwise they would have said, nah, and walked away. That would, that would not be a reinforcing consequence. So hopefully you can see here how we view ABCs of all kinds of different behaviors, of all different age ranges and developmental levels, things like that. Let's do a quick ASR, active student responding. Ready? So the antecedent, you really miss your friends. So what do you do? You post on social media and you get likes and shares. Is this behavior more likely to happen in the future? Yes or no? Stop and think. Yes, it's more likely to happen in the future because you're getting a consequence that is reinforcing. And remember, our definition of reinforcement is, we'll find out on the next slide, ready? When something happens after a behavior that increases the likelihood that that behavior will occur in the future, the ABA term is punishment, function, reinforcement, or antecedent. Stop and think. Yes, reinforcement, right? So um, if it's increasing the behavior, then it's being reinforced. That's the message that we really want you to understand about how to teach new behaviors, okay? How we increase skills using ABA. This is how we do it. We arrange the environment, so we set up the antecedents and the consequences, so that reinforcement happens after the behavior that we set as the goal. So we analyze in the assessment phase, when we're analyzing what's happening with the behavior, and when, when Marilyn showed you the service delivery model, the thing we're looking at is, where's the source of reinforcement for the challenging behavior that's keeping the challenging behavior going and going and going in the future? And how can we build in reinforcement for the skill that we want to teach instead? Or in some cases, the skill that we just want to put on acquisition, even when there isn't any challenging behavior involved. Okay, so this is a video clip from The Big Bang Theory, um, and it's just a really funny way that they tie in reinforcement, okay? So let's take a look together. Are you finished? Well, thank you. How thoughtful. Would you like a chocolate? Um, yeah, sure. You? I didn't notice. Have a chocolate. Thank you. <laughs> You're here a lot now. Oh, am I talking too much? I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chocolate? Yes, please. Okay. I know what you're doing. Really? Yes. You're using chocolates as positive reinforcement for what you consider correct behavior. <laughs> Very good. So there you go, right? So what are they doing here? They're tying in all the different things that we've talked about in this module. What's Penny's skill deficit? Cooperation um, to the things that, um, you know, um, might otherwise not, not be happening. So the skill to teach is that cooperation. So uh, she likes chocolate, that's a preference. We might have identified in the pre a formal preference assessment or an informal preference assessment. So what happens here is that if the antecedent is there's dirty dishes and Penny cleans up the dishes, 
Sheldon is making sure he's running over there and giving her some chocolate because he wants that to continue to happen. If Penny sits in Sheldon's seat, he looks at her, Penny moves seats. That's the behavior we want her to continue. So he gives her chocolate to make sure she's super cooperative next time, right? Uh, Penny's talking a lot. Sheldon looks at her again. She stops talking. Sheldon gives her a chocolate. So that's just a funny example of how we can use reinforcement or how reinforcement happens every day. It's not always that explicit and it's not always Sheldon meaning to do it, but that's how reinforcement works. Okay, so hopefully you've uh, learned a little bit this module about how to increase skills using ABA. Again, I'm Jen Naradka, and it's been a pleasure to bring you through this process. Next up is Robin Bertrand, who um, is just so awesome, and she's going to bring you through um, behavior reduction. So when there's some challenging behaviors involved, how do we use ABA to reduce those? So you're going to hear more about reinforcement. You're going to hear more about the ABCs of behavior, and you're really going to just dive in more deeply into this learning. So thank you so much for joining me, and I hope that uh, you have a great day.